Hello everybody, welcome to Blue Marble Science. Adam Meekin and Quantum Eraser are going to discuss airplanes and flight, and they're going to get it wrong a brand new way. Warning, severe facial and monitor damage alert is in effect, get out the oven mitts, move the monitors back out of punching range, and let's light this dumpster fire and have some fun. It's 2018 when I last probably did this, so if I miss bits out of please forgive me but i'll try and get through it and then maybe save any questions for the end um okay so yeah so this was many moons ago when accelerometers first came out um it was our first contact me and john were contacted by paul on the plane wanting a bit of advice on these accelerometers and we were coming up with all sorts of methods of testing what was going off and Paul settled for turning it off traveling across the Atlantic and switching it back on now what I'd suggested was to keep the accelerometer and see if we could plot vectors uh, based on the, the, the plane's movement which was a little naive back in the day um, so that it kind of I'll explain why um, so the first thing is to ask, how does a plane behave? Um, and unlike a car, um, a plane is very different. The, 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 the front of the vehicle, a vehicle, um, isn't pointing in the direction of travel, um, is the first consequent. Um, and that is... It's basically a consequent of how, how planes work, obviously. Uh, they basically fly, straight fly is achieved uh, at an upward angle of between two and three degrees, slightly more sometimes in larger aircraft. Um, the nose never actually angles down during flight. That isn't strictly true. During the descent phase of a flight, we may actually have the nose angled down slightly, but we'll let that go. And the way in which altitude is lost is by reducing this uh, angle of attack or reducing speed or combinations of both and that results in a decrease in upward thrust okay so you can lose your ability to maintain level flight net effect a slight drop um so basically a slight tilt backwards is usual for straight and level flight and by straight and level i mean a vector roger roger what's our vector victor that is straight and level and how we experience it <clears throat> so I'll keep this bit to a minimum, but basically on, on, a, on a flight, you can see my feet there. I've got my accelerometer bubble app there. And basically I've got my other phone. And throughout the duration of the flight, I'm recording it so that I can take some readings. Adam. Adam. Let me see here, look. Adam. That's a bubble level. That's not an accelerometer. That's an accelerometer. Have you been talking to Anthony Riley again? This is my egg. This is my parts per million counter. It's going to measure the density of the, the tap water. Pretty much. It's always in a positive flight. So just to summarize what the readings I took. So how did the flight behave? So I measured the middle hour of a two hour flight. I wanted to be not worrying about descent or, or, or gaining out or take off. So it was just to monitor that vector of travel or multiple vectors of travel in that middle hour. Roger, Roger. What's our vector, Victor? Um, now, all of the readings vary between one and four degrees upward incline uh, during the monitor times. They were never level, never got to even level flight, and it certainly never got anywhere near nosing down. Now on the flight, the assumed speed was about 850 kilometers. So we'll say a distance roughly of about 800 kilometers was was covered during this uh, hour's analysis. So as I've said, I've tried to relate it to a vector because uh, obviously what I was initially looking at that was just to try and plot this to see, um, you know, being open minded that we would, if we were going to be circumnavigating a ball, there would be significant vector changes to accommodate for that. Um, 
So you can see here, look, the plane's pointing up, but when we're describing the vector of the the actual fl uh, plane's flight, it is the dotted line there. OK, now there's a load more flight details that I bothered to look into so that pitch angles, angles of attack and all this. But basically, the relevant point is uh, the, the way the where where the plane is flying is the straight line flight path vector that describes its movement. So, with all that in mind and the data gathered, I wanted to just kind of discuss the concept of how does the the ground change on a flat plane and a ball when you're flying uh, in a straight line vector. Um, orientation, direction of gravity remain the same if we're traveling across a flat plane, summarized. Uh, if we're traveling across a, a ball Earth, then the orientation direction of gravity will vary away a rate of 0 0.009 degrees per kilometer of straight line vector travel. OK, so if we look at this and this is my wonderful CGI, if this is my plane flying in its straight line vector, um, then the orientation of direction of gravity. Um, now, the plane's traveling in this direction and the orientation of gravity or down, as we would like to call it, and forgive the vernaculars, um, is at this point, plumb, plumb straight down. And as we traverse across a flat plane at this point, that is exactly the same direction um, relative and opposed as well. And at the end of the flight, that is the same. So there is absolutely no change um, in the direction of down created by the straight line flight that we had. If we were to do the same and assuming we're traversing a ball, excuse me, then there's the same straight line vector. And this is where we talk about this accumulated altitude. You can see from here to here, at the bottom end is it's a larger angle, uh, sorry, it's a larger distance from the plane to the ground if we've traversed across the ball. Um, at the beginning of the flight, the direction of down, assuming we live on a ball, was orientated between the straight line path down to the center of their ball. As we traverse across the ball, this has an effect because not only is the ground falling away, it's reorientating itself back to the center of supposed ball. So as I said, this is at a rate of 0 0.009 degrees per kilometer, a very small, small amount. Um, I say it, it does feel small and that's one of the ways in which ballers would try to excuse this, but on light altitude, uh, which can be adjusted for during the flight uh, simply by um, altering pitch angle or altering thrust speed, which will re cause a reduction in upward thrust, which will affect altitude. You can mitigate for that in, in the flight. What you don't do by altering or not altering below zero, the pitch angle, uh, and irrespective of thrust speed is you do not reorientate the plane um, with regards to the angular change that's been, cre been created. So what would this look like on a plane? This is, this is what's being suggested. Now, you can see with this plane that it, it maintains the same altitude um, from the surface of the Earth or in their theory, the, the center of the ball. And it's doing that by, like I say, thrust and, and pitch angle variations. So it stays the same height as it traverses, but there is the secondary consequence is the, the ball is reorientating itself. Uh, the plane is not 
at any point compensating for this by maintaining a straight line vector and not allowing the pitch angle to ro uh, rock below zero into negatives there is no compensation in the in the flight for this so what would this feel like and if we take the the top line this is kind of an expression of of what's happening for the passenger they, they would be sitting in their plane but the orientation of where they feel was down would be increases You're an idiot. as they as they fly to the point where they would be feeling like they're tilting further and further back in their seats or more likely the, the general experience would be that the plane is, is on an upward incline as demonstrated in the bottom ones so that that would be the net effect of of traveling without reorientating even if you do mitigate for your altitude by changing speeds so just a quick summary of, of what i did during the one hour flight of monitor um only a constant incline of orientation between one and four degrees was observed no resultant change in orientation with respect to gravitational pull was experienced or measured conclusion the observations and measurements found no evidence for curvature as would be experienced or measured by traveling across a ball of circumference 40,000 kilometers. Results and measurements would indicate travel occurred with lines of gravity parallel to each other and perpendicular to the line of straight travel across a flat plane. Oh, won't somebody please think of the children? Adam got a few things right, but he got a lot of things wrong, and we need to sort that out. So I'm going to put on my flight instructor hat for a few minutes, and we'll talk about this. The airplane, like any other solid body, has a center of gravity, and the center of gravity is simply the point where if we pick the plane up at that center of gravity, it would be perfectly balanced in every axis. But when we're flying the airplane, we're not picking the plane up at the center of gravity. The wing is generating lift, and so are the other parts of the fuselage and, and the airframe, and that lift has a center also and the center of lift is always behind the center of gravity it's aft of the center of gravity because we want the plane to be stable now i'm going to show you the acceleration of gravity and we need to keep track of where that is because it's all about these balancing forces anybody that's ever tried to balance a pencil on their finger or whatever understands the center of gravity issue and can easily see that if we didn't do anything with the center of gravity in front of the point that it's being lifted the center of lift the plane would fly in a nose down attitude it wouldn't fly long like that for sure but that's what would happen now the center of gravity is the point around which uh, the aircraft rotates in every axis. So it's pretty easy to fix this. All we need to do is push down on the tail of the plane. And by pushing down on the tail of the plane, we can raise the nose back to a normal attitude of two or three degrees, whatever is good for the airspeed that we're trying to achieve. And that's done with the elevator. That's done with a trim tab on the elevator. But pay attention that, again, the acceleration of gravity direction has not changed in any of these diagrams. And the airplane is balanced because of the direction of gravity in the orientation that we see it right now. So where did Adam go wrong? Well, he went wrong thinking that the airplane would just ignore that gravity vector, and it won't. Let me show you my diagram. I turned the little plane around just for the sake of being consistent with the way uh, Adam had shown his diagram. And I also showed it flying in outer space just because I know that's going to irritate the hell out of the flat earthers. But pay attention to the direction of the gravity vector and the orientation of the airplane. The airplane will not continue flying straight off into outer space. That doesn't happen. It's balanced around the gravity vector. And that's the reason you're wrong, Adam. This is how it really works. Well, hopefully that angle, that that one gets the point across for me. It really is. It's very small, but it would be noticeable. And, you know, the consequence of this all is, of course, that 
the plane would have to adjust, would have to adjust because the aerodynamic changes that would occur, uh, the reality of what the plane would encounter, which you don't even consider in this. It's just kind of to exemplify the point that if you did believe that you live on a ball and you do believe this is straight line flight, this is what you'd experience in just an hour. You'd have tilted back that spot of 10 degrees. All right, let's hear it, QE. I'm sharing my screen. Let me finish then, John. I'm out. Just need anybody to read it out so it's verbal for those who don't watch and only listen. Okay, I'll read it out. If P, this is Modus Tollens, if P, then Q, not Q, therefore not P. If commercial planes travel at 500 miles per hour for two hours, that's 1,000 miles, over a sphere with a radius of 3,959 miles, P, it would then have to descend, negotiate 128.3 miles of vertical drop over the course of its journey, Q. Commercial planes do not descend 128 Point three miles while traveling at 500 miles for two hours. That is, they fly level, not Q. Therefore, the Earth is not a sphere. Therefore, not P. That wasn't much of a try, Huey. Basically, what you just said is the Earth is flat because I say it's flat. Airplanes experience the acceleration of gravity just like everything else in the vicinity of our planet. Let me give you a modus tollens that actually works. If the Earth is flat, P, then the shortest distance between any two points on an azimuthal equidistant map would be a straight line, Q. The shortest distance between two points is not a straight line on an azimuthal equidistance map, not Q. It's a great circle route, QE. Therefore, the Earth is not flat, not P. Chew on that one for a while. Hey, thanks for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons down there. There's a link to the Patreon. It'll be in the uh, description. And I guess we'll see you guys on the next one. Hey, Gladys. We're out of here.